Well, good morning, church. It is a good day to be in the presence of the Lord. Amen. So we are in week four uh, of a sermon series on the book of Colossians. So this is a, a letter written by Paul to the believers in Colossae. And we saw that Paul begins his letter by connecting with and encouraging the fellow believers and, and just kind of pouring out his love on them, praying over them and building up their faith. And we all need a little bit of that sometimes, don't we? So Paul then moves on to remind them and us that Jesus is supreme. He is God. He is creator. He is ruler over all. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together together. The blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross was payment in full for our sin debt, and now we can be reconciled with God and live in fellowship and relationship with him. And it is a privilege and an honor to be people who help point others to Jesus. So we pick up our study today in chapter 2. We're starting at verse 6, and scripture says this, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Well, let's stop right there. It says, so then, and that's kind of like a therefore. And every time you see a therefore in scripture, you should ask yourself, well, what is that there for? And so that means that you have to go back and, and look to find out what was said before, before you can move forward to the next thing. <clears throat> so what Paul was talking about in these verses above is that the things of God, the hope and the peace and the power and the contentment are found only through Jesus. But Jesus is the great mystery of God, and for those who do not come to that place of seeking God, they don't know Jesus, and he remains a mystery, and because that mystery has not yet been made known to them, they just don't really understand how it is that people can give up living life on their own and in their own interest and instead orient their lives around the things of God. And until the mystery is made known to them, it will just always kind of sound a little too good to be true. And the message of Jesus, well, it is so good. The reality of having him in your life is so amazing, so precious, so pure, that those who do not understand it and those who do not have it cannot help but try to talk you out of it because it just sounds too good to be true. So Paul had reminded us that we need to understand that and we need to be on our guard. We need to be prepared for those interactions with people so that we will not become shaken by them. So that's what he said before. And then, so then, just as you received Christ, he says, live Christ. Rooted and built up, strengthened in your faith and overflowing with thankfulness. Verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the element of spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. So let's pause right there and talk about that. He says, see to it. That means pay attention, be diligent, stay alert. There are people who come with a message that sounds good and it sounds like it's from God, but it's not. Now, this is a little bit of a different warning than what we just talked about. There are people who don't know Jesus, and they want to talk you out of following him. But then there are also people who know enough of Jesus to misunderstand and misrepresent him. So these are messages that are godly enough, but they don't depend on God. They are deceptive philosophies that sound like they are built on the principles of Jesus, but they are really based on the things of this world. So it is taking the word of God and wrapping it around the things of the world instead of taking the things of the world and bringing them into submission to the principles of God. So what does that look like? What is an example of that? Well, let's take this philosophy. In the kingdom of God, there are people who are believers, faithful followers who preach and teach a prosperity doctrine, which basically means that if as a follower of Christ, you are not financially prosperous, then you're doing something wrong spiritually. 
They say if you are not rich, then you are not blessed and God is not working in your life. Now, let me be very clear here. I have no problem with God's people being rich. I am all for it, amen? I'd like to be rich, and I'd like all of you to be rich. I see no biblical contradiction in saying that God wants you to prosper. But when prosperity is seen as the necessary manifestation of God's presence and proof of your deep spiritual connection, that's where I see a problem. And the flip side of the prosperity doctrine is the poverty doctrine that some folks teach, which basically says that if you are not poor in the eyes of the world, then you can't be rich in the presence of God. That following Jesus is about giving up things of this world. And and if you're not living paycheck to paycheck and driving around in a car that's held together by Christian bumper stickers, then you are just not really a committed Christ follower. So let me be clear here. I have no problem with God's people being poor. I see no biblical contradiction in saying that the things of this world can be a stumbling block to your spiritual intensity. But when giving up all material possessions is seen as the necessary manifestation of God's presence and proof of your deep spiritual connection, well, there is where I see a problem. You see, what I see in in this doctrine is you know what? God blesses his people. It doesn't matter if you have a hundred million dollars in the bank or if you don't even have a dollar in the bank. God still blesses you when you live and walk according to his word. And I think that we need to preach about prosperity because I believe God does prosper his people. And his people can do things in the world when, that require those financial means. And so God does bless. And I do believe that we need to preach about po- poverty because I believe that God does call people to depend not on the materials and conveniences of this world, but to depend on him. And God can do great things with those testimonies of people who have nothing, and yet they are so full of joy and peace because they know that God alone is their strength. In principle, is not money, it's commitment to the things of God and a willingness to use whatever you have and whoever you are in this world to be a vehicle that draws you closer to God and points people to Jesus. But when we preach only prosperity or only poverty, what we are doing is taking the word of God and we are wrapping it around the things of our world using God's word as a justification for being rich or being poor or, and using it as a, a springboard for encouraging others to be in the same condition. What we should be doing instead is taking the things of the world and bringing them under, into submission to the word of God. It doesn't matter how much money you have or don't have if you have no love or, or peace or joy operating in your life. When we put God's principles first, when we become people of integrity and humility and compassion, when we know that God is the source of provision and wisdom and strength and life, when we walk in his word and become more like him, we will see his life fill us up and flow out of us. And then we can learn to take the circumstances of the world and of our lives and mold them into obedience to the word of God, to the things that give glory to him. And so what I see Paul saying here is that it is a danger that God's people can take a principle, a situation that is really more about the world and wrap God's word around it instead of grabbing hold of God's word and bringing the things in our lives into obedience to that word. It's a danger. It happens. These are movements that will gain, posperity, gain popularity among people, even church people. They will sound like they are based on the principles of Christ, but if you really look at them, if you begin to peel back the layers, you will see that they are really based more on human tradition and the basic principles of the world. They are hollow and deceptive philosophies, Paul says. And you and I, we need the wisdom of God to be able to discern if what we are hearing and seeing is based on God or if it is really rooted in the reality of our humanness and what sounds like it's good and it makes sense in our situation. See to it, 
Paul says, that no one takes you captive to hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of the world rather than Christ. This is a, this is a pretty important thing Paul is saying here. And I know that I just kind of dumped some heavy stuff on you, but I know too for some of you there's a giant light bulb that just lit up above your head because I know that many of you like me in our desire to be pleasing to God and to see him fill up more spaces in our lives and in our hearts, there are times when you and I have been caught up in these convincing thoughts and movements. Because I think that the truth is, we want so much to know God. We want to know that he is with us, that he is moving around us, that he is speaking to us, that we are so desperate to see him that we sometimes just take it a little bit too far. We, we want that quick answer. We want that five-point sermon that will help us get out of debt in just two weeks. We want those ten steps to healing because we want to be healed and we want to be whole and we want the things of God in our lives and we want those things to give us, to give God glory. Sometimes... We want that so much that we get caught up in the formula that we receive from God's servants and we forget that the answer is not in the formula, it is in God. You know, so often as a pastor, people come to me asking, what is it that I need to do? What is it that I need to do to see victory in my life? What is it that I need to do to find answers for my future or to have unity in my marriage? What is it that I need to do? What's the formula. And the reality is this. There is no formula. There's only one God. And he has given us his word. And he has made a way for us to be in relationship with him. And everything we need is found in him alone. Not in his people. We want, we want somebody to just tell us what to do. Tell me, pastor, what God wants me to do. And I'll do it because I want his presence in my life. Well, here it is. God wants you to read his word. He wants you to talk to him, and he wants you to listen to him. Well, come on now, Pastor. Isn't there something else you can give me? Because I really need his presence right now, and, well, I just don't read that fast. Truth is, when I go to God and I talk to him and he gives me an answer and shows me what I need to do or think about this thing, that answer is God's answer for me and my circumstances. And it might not be the same as God's answer for you that he would give to you in your circumstances. We can learn from each other. We can seek for wisdom, and we can seek for prayer from one another. We can struggle through some stuff together, and God can plant seeds in me through you as I listen to your experience and what God did for you. But the only way that I'm going to know what God has for me is to ask him for myself and to learn for myself how to hear his voice. Don't ask for a formula that will help you discern God's voice. See, the spiritual process, it's different for all of us. But I'll tell you this, I have never met a Christ follower who has sustained victory in their lives and yet never ever opens this book. You see, God speaks to us in his word, and he speaks differently to you than he does to me. And above all things, we need to be seeking him through his word. Now, don't get me wrong. There are lots of great resources out there about the things of God. And we need to be fellowshipping together. We need to be with other believers. We need to be doing study activities. We need to be digging a little bit deeper and hearing the message that God has given to his servants we need to have good preaching and teaching and testimonies and prayer times. Those are all good things, but above all those things is that you and I need to be in the word. And we need to be listening to God speak to us. You see, he will tell you what you need. We just need to be in the right place to hear what it is he has to speak through us. We need to be pressing in and training ourselves to listen, to obey his word. And you won't know it if you don't read it. Here's what I know. As human beings, we push back against the idea of being in God's word. I wish I had a dime for every time I heard someone say, well, I don't really understand the Bible, so I don't read it very much. 
But I pray all the time, and I know that God speaks to me, and I'm doing just fine. But hear me, church. With all the love I have in my heart, I am telling you, it does not work that way. God speaks through his word, and it is through his word that we find connection to him. You see, the word of God, it is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, and it cuts to the heart of things. And because this word is alive, when we read it, when we dig into it, when we come to it and we say, God, please open up your word to me today, what happens is that as we read the word, the Holy Spirit begins to speak to our hearts that we may understand and not just, not just understand the words on the page, but understand the meaning of those words. How those words, those principles, those messages are relevant in our lives. How we can begin to see the wisdom of God and how we can bring those things under submission to his ways. And when we try to apply what we know of God apart from being in his word, well, so often that just leaves us leaning in one direction or another based on what we think we think and not on the truth and principles and power of God at work in his word. You see, it's not that the answers are in this book. It is that the answers are found in the God of this book. And he has given us his word to be a means by which we can come to know him better and hear him more clearly. And it's not so much that he speaks through the words written on the page, but that as we read the words on the page, he speaks. He unfolds things in our hearts that help us to see and to know him better. And that's why we can't just pray and never read the word because the word helps to form our prayers and to position ourselves in a place where we can hear his voice and know his ways. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of the world rather than on Christ. Well, to be honest, I thought that I would actually get all the way through this chapter today. But next time, we'll move on from this place where we're going to leave off here. But I want to read to you before we go. uh, Verse 9 says this, verses 9 and 10. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. Paul says, because you are in Christ, because you live Jesus, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority, because you have Jesus, you can stand strong and not be taken captive and deceived by the things that are not of God. Because you have Jesus, you can discern the things that are of God and the things that are of this world. Because you have Jesus, you have all you need. You know the source. You just have to be diligent about tapping in to the source. And we have a wonderful family of believers to be in fellowship with. And in fellowship, we are called to point one another to Jesus and just love each other along the way. See, we don't have to fix each other. We don't have to save each other. All we need to do is love each other and point to Jesus because it is him that we proclaim We point to him. The strength and the wisdom we need are found in him. Amen? Pray with me, church. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for this day to come around your word. God, we thank you for the wisdom that you give us, the the gems of wisdom that you gave to Paul that he has passed on to us in your word, words that you want us to know. God, I pray today that you would help us to discern the things, the philosophies that we're hearing, the thoughts that are, that are flowing all around us all the time that, that may sound good and may sound like God, but God, I pray that you would help us above and beyond all things to come back to you, to press in to you. 
That we would spend our time not so much on listening to all the thoughts about you, but we would spend our time on reading your word and praying to you, talking to you, listening to you, coming to know you better and better. God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that in this country we have the freedom to access your word in so many different ways. And God, forgive us for the reality that we don't access your word as often as we should, as much as you would love for us to, as much as the opportunity that you've given us provides. God, I pray that you would just speak to our hearts, that you would be at work in our lives, that you would put a hunger and thirst for your ways in our hearts like we have never known. God, that we might come to you and find that you are everything we need. God, we thank you and we praise you for everything you are and everything you do in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.